Hello, I'm Don Westwater. Welcome back to this channel. Let's cut to the chase. You might be wondering, why am I reading Brick by Brick? You read the title. Why am I covering Bob Chipman's magnum opus? Well, why am I going through it? And to be honest, it's because I find him such a fascinating guy, Bob Chipman. He's had a bit of a weird uh, shelf life. You know, one of the early internet sketch reviewer types. Um, never got a lot of traction. Got a small following on The Escapist. Was contemporary to uh, Extra Credits. And was on the same website as them. And Yahtzee. Um, most of these days he's known for his... Um, his tweets, which are quite terrible. And infamously so. But because of his weird and bizarre... Uh, eccentric worldview, I guess. Um, it means that he'll sometimes say something really interesting and then some, some say something really stupid or just bizarre. And it, there's always been this one book called Brick by Brick. It was his book where he would review, went through Super Mario 3 um, step by step. Like shot by shot, play by play. And I heard it was bad. And I heard also that it talks about his life in there. Like he talks about his own life in there for some reason. And I was kind of curious. Like, like what, is it, what is this book? What is this book? So I decided for fun to make this rambly vlog series like I did for GDC. But instead of GDC, it is a terrible book written 10 years ago. Uh, more than 10, a little more than 10 years ago. This section is just covers the, just the introduction to Movie Bob and uh, the first section, part one of the book. Um, excuse me. Um, just to give a little more context to some things you need to know about Movie Bob, I think to make this more interesting for those of you who don't know and are not my brother, um, he is really, really into Nintendo. He has a huge fixation on them. He loves Nintendo so much and Mario in specific. Um, and it shows in this book. Well, I'll get to it, but it, it definitely shows. He has a lot of this sort of techno technocracy fetishism where he he loves people who are who are good at science and loves the idea of them running society uh that shows up in his work to an extent um he has a huge nostalgia got nostalgia goggles for the 80s and the 90s for like the, the classic era of like nes video gaming uh, and he tends to have weird opinions about modern day gaming and doesn't quite understand it as well. Um, and in his spare time, well not spare time, his main job is a film critic. His film criticism, I think is a lot less weird in his game when he would talk about games. Like he would say some weird, his opinions about games would get even, would, would, like he once would, said that Metroid Other M um, was a game about stoicism and criticizing it for being sexist actually meant that you were xenophobic. That, like, that's the kind of tier we're working with, or we're, was working with. I think he's mellowed out a little, well, he's not mellowed out much at all, to be honest. Sorry, let's get to it. Jumping right in. Um, something of note immediately stood out to me is, so this is distributed by Fangamer, so it's um, it's kind of hard to find. You have to find places that have been, uh, that have just been archived somewhere to really get at it. Um, 
He dedicates Shigeru Miyamoto. Of course he does. But the people he dedicates are his family, one of his dead relatives, Shigeru Miyamoto. He's the first name, by the way, on, on this list. He's put first. So I want you to, to bear that thought in mind as we, uh, <laughs> as we go on. Um, also, um, so the, he opens up by saying, why am I talking about Super Mario 3? Which is what he's going to do, this shot by shot uh, criticism of, and talks about how there's not a lot of traditional film-esque criticism for video games, which is funny given that video essays have become so popular in the year of our Lord, uh, 2024. So at the time of 2013, when this book was published, that kind of made sense. It wasn't like extra credits talking seriously about games was novel for YouTube. Um, most of it was more comedic and silly or riffy, more riff tracks, MST3K energy. It wasn't as genuinely interested in what the games meant or signified because that was not just not what the audience at the time was really interested in as much. I was not always in vogue. So his desire is to do this play by play. And he argues he wants to do it. Well, it has to be about something familiar, something popular that people would understand, something older, I guess, because it's secure. He says that. That's the exact wording. Which he's clearly contriving a way to build up to saying it's Super Mario Brothers 3. My favorite part is when he says it's not not out of nostalgia or sentiment. Like he's implying like he's some impartial, professional, and now analyst. He has no stake in the game when he like he's doing this because he loves Super Mario Three. Like that, that's clearly the reason. This entire thing is just a really weird pose that's not very convincing. So I I don't get it. It's just it does not land. He does not land this one. <laughs> Oh, he does compare Mario to Elvis in the fir this first section as well. Um, yeah, he's he's like he's this gener he's Gen X's Elvis, and um, I guess uh, the beat or the Beatles, and then I think Pac-Man's Chuck Berry in this analogy. He says that, not me. Um, something. Da, da. Let's skip to something more interesting. Oh, here's something I find a little interesting, actually. Um, so he asserts basically in his beginning, because he starts out after he does this, why am I doing this? He does a history of Mario, which covers Mario's entire history up to this point, as in 2013, which is a bit weird for a book about Super Mario 3, a game who's rel who, who who that com has come out way before most of the modern like a lot of Mario Mario modern Mario stuff. So why does he cover everything in the '90s and beyond? Beats me. I think it's part of this because he's trying to build this what's uh, haggy this sort of um, hagiography uh, of. Mario, like treating him like a saint. Like it's really describing him like this. He came in, he saved gaming, he is the best. Shikiguma Mirado is a god among men. Like it's really heavily singing the praises of Shikigur Miyamoto and Moto and Nintendo in general and Mario in specific. And one of the ways he does that is he asserts that back in his day, uh characters weren't focus grouped to death which they definitely i guess they in his mind that was something that was real they were made only when for the, the necessity of the situation they're made with more integrity which he has no sources for that he just sort of says that makes that claim which given the mascot platformer era and the era of mascots in general in the 80s hyper commercial period I, and tie-ins 
Like that seems so BS. Like right, like it's it's such a an era of commercialism and tie in characters that are clearly made to market shit to children. It's just it, it's just so rose tinted, and the implication that like two thousand thirteen was like unique for having being the year like the modern era was, was all focus group is I don't know how true that is. Like I can imagine that focus grouping does influence the character design of characters in, in games at that point. Famously uh, for Bioshock Infinite, the reason that Boku the Wit was put on the front of the box was because they thought it would appeal to college age boys. So like there's elements of that where there's focus grouping that's guiding the way that the marketing's being done and character design is kind of tied into that somewhat. So it's not unreasonable claim. It's just a weird, I think it's, he, it feels like he's exaggerating. So that seems weird to me. And this bit afterwards too, part of this hero worship he's, he's laying on is he says that Mario saved console. So what he's referring to is the console crash in the early eighties. He's talking about the console. He's talking about like before the console wars, the death of Atari, that period. And he treats Mario as if the NES revived gaming. Like gaming was on the verge of dying. This is not quite accurate in a technical sense because like PC gaming wasn't super popular yet, but it was around and growing. Like the Commodore sixty four was released at the beginning of the 80s. So home computers, like the home console was becoming, like the home computer was becoming more of a thing because of stuff like the Commodore 64. And games, PC gaming was becoming a growing market. In fact, that market's growth is what builds the stage for the 90s and the more traditional home computer setup. Like if it wasn't for that, it, we wouldn't get the stuff we see in the 90s. So it's like this framing is somewhat disingenuous from a technical standpoint but he's doing it because he needs mario to be like the most important thing he is the saint that has saved everything we owe everything to him he is gaming um and thereby basically give more credence to why he is valid for loving mario so much in a sense like that's what you know hagiography is for it's really justifying and um, stoling the virtues of your saint, which in this case, it's a plumber who is, quote, who is a, perceived to be Italian for some reason. Uh, as we keep going on. Uh, so afterwards, he gets into the console wars, which I find, the funny bit I find about this is that he just says, well, Nintendo won. Like, Nintendo won the console wars, which... It's true. I mean, Sega died out. They flamed out. So in that sense, is correct. But like, with that context of him being like such a diehard Nintendo person to the point where he called a Super Mario movie the the thing that he was waiting for since childhood. Um, I just just tick. It's just, just like I see who I see what. Who, okay, okay, movie Bob. Not wrong, but funny to me. Um, so, uh, Sonic shows up, console wars. Um, oh, right. At this point in my notes, I start noticing that the way he's been talking about Mario at this point is it's if the reader has never touch games before he's explaining a bunch of stuff that if you're in the gaming like, culture you know a lot of this already this is not new to you but yet he'll use terms like first party third party software third party software um home console pc gaming um stuff like this terms which you know if i was writing for an audience that knew nothing i wouldn't be using those terms Right, because third and first party, those aren't those are terms that we specifically associate. To, they mean a very specific thing in a gaming context, as in the 
for first party as in the, the people who make the console producing stuff for themselves and third party someone else um, in the transaction. It's a very, yeah, he's using these terms, which if I was trying to make a book that was trying to lead people in, I, I wouldn't be mentioning, I wouldn't be adding these asides about like them being third party or first party or trying to explain these titles. I would or explain them in, with those jargon. I would just say like, oh, it's a party game, party game here, party game here. I wouldn't even worry about like the consoles because he keeps name dropping it, that stuff. He loves like adding these little details that only really makes sense if you have them been immersed in the culture. And yet he's writing it with such redundancy because he's trying to re-explain everything like you're just got into gaming history and you, you're learning this for the first time. It's strange. It's strange. It's like he's writing to a child, but he's clearly not because the references he's making are go way over the head. So it's... And, so it's just weird. I don't understand quite who the audience is. Like what? Like what? Casual person drops money? Like it's being published by Fan Gamer. Who is your audience? It's not casual fans. It's like diehards. Don't re-explain this over and over. Just assume that they know it. I think it's probably because if he he didn't didn't. If he doesn't do this history bit, he doesn't get to flex, maybe? Like, he needs to assume that they don't know, because then he can get them in on the secret to make him feel more smart. Because he likes, he has a very kind of smug attitude a lot of the time. He can be quite condescending. It wouldn't be surprising to me, but very weird. It's, it's, that's very weird. Um... Compares Nintendo to Disney after there's a console wars bit because their image has been associated with being uncool. That seems accurate, frankly. That's not a bad comparison. Um, Super Mario 64 is successful, but he doesn't show up again until, until like another platformer too much later. Things move on to uh, Xbox and PlayStation, but then our beloved savior after his hard time. Like he calls it hard times, by the way. Mario not being in a third party game. And in a first party game, I mean. Which he doesn't really like excel the actual hard times Nintendo was faced with given the failure of the GameCube. He doesn't really talk about their their failure there's in that way. Like he'll bring up sales when it makes them look cool, but he will be silent when it makes them kind of look like they've made mistakes. So it's, this is what I mean, it's, it's true hagiography. It's, it's not telling this as the actual history, it's telling it to hype up Mario. So when he gets to this point, he's like, oh, the Wii really changed everything and it put them right back on top again. And well, you know, Mario comes back and he's more successful than ever, more relevant than ever. And they thought he's just an old stogie. He's actually relevant. And therefore, I'm relevant, says the subtext, which has been the biggest issue of his career is that he has not been relevant. In fact, he struggles to be relevant. It's one of his biggest problems. He has a bad time. He has a, his own idiosyncrasies make him difficult for him to actually read the room. So, oops. Um... I feel bad for my my brother a little bit here. So I feel like I'm, I'm rehashing stuff I've, I've told to him before. Uh, well, it's what it is. What else is in here in this little... My notes. Um, right. We're about to reach the end of my current bit. We're about to reach the end of uh, part one, which is where I'll stop this video. Um, and then I'll write Gree up through part two, write my notes, and then come back and make a video whenever I do that. Um, it's a 200-page book. It's not that long, actually. I, I don't think it'll take that long for me to finish this. I probably could get it done this weekend.
if I really put the time in. So, yeah, basically at this point, he ends this bit with this really clunky line. Oh, I, I don't have it written down, so I can't quote it. But he, he ends it, he ends it by saying something to the effect of like, um, Mario must have, Mario has left a powerful impression on, on gaming. And oh, well, he also left a powerful impression on me. It's like, it's really kind of clunky, like cheesy, like, uh, kind of like, it's, gr it's so groan worthy. Um, so yeah. Closing this out to give this a little more focus. This book already we're seeing some warning signs, right? He'll ramble off a bit. He'll bring up trivia details that really don't matter. He'll he'll go on this tangent. I call a tangent really. Like when talking about the history, he's going up and talking past. Super Mario 3, which he frames as this big watershed event, like the height of Mario's popularity, and then everything else is really a downhill, and then he comes relevant again. It just confuses the narrative. Why add this bit? I, it, it's not helping your narrative. If you want him to be the watershed moment, then why talk about the bit that creates this sort of W, right? It's not that satisfying. It's very weird. Either he's always been rel like he's basically trying to have his cake and eat it too by making this a special moment, but also like it's just another path on the perpetual train of success. So it's um so if I were to just cut that, if I were him, I would stretch this better too. I would try to tell the audience what they should be expecting more. He just starts barreling into this stuff. In fact, he's about to, because I've read it a little bit ahead, he's about to barrel into his early childhood, which is like such a. It comes right out of nowhere. Because like, he's opened this up saying, like, I'm going to do traditional film criticism. And this isn't it. Like, I've read some, like, not a lot, but I've read some traditional film criticism. Like, I've listened to Pauline Kael's Circles and Squares, a really funny essay where she basically tears apart all of the popular directors of the 60s and auteur theory. It's actually quite, even if you don't agree with it, it's a, a fun read. But that wasn't like, she didn't suddenly start talking about her childhood and all the history of film up to this point. Like she, she's like, you know this. You're contemporaries. You have eyes and ears and or read the news. I trust that you know what I'm talking about. But he doesn't. He doesn't trust his audience at all. He doesn't know what his audience is. This seems like, it's like what I'm doing, it's, it's just rambly. And unlike me, where I'm just doing this as my first impressions of the book, he's been thinking about this for a while, right? I mean, he's writing this down. Where is the structure? Uh, I don't know. It's not boring, though. I'll come back once I read the next bit. I might do it immediately because I find it kind of interesting because I, you know, Movie Bob's weird energy is kind of, kind of fascinating, even when he's being, you know, Silly. But yeah, I'll come back once I have more information. Up next, his childhood, how he gets into Mario, and maybe actual analysis instead of spoon feeding history. I don't know. Until then, bye.